Welcome to Clean Air for All by Yuhu. It's a podcast from Yuhu about creating a healthy home and life with good indoor air quality. Each month we will speak with experts and share helpful information and insights about anything and everything that concerns the air we breathe and how we can protect the health and safety of our homes and families while we stay indoors. From understanding indoor pollutants, the benefits of ventilation, the importance of continuous air quality monitoring to new technologies and more. This is Matthias Gelber, your host of the show. I'm really excited today to be here and I'm called the Green Man. I love looking at environmental issues, air quality issues, how we can improve them for our lives, for our families and for the community in general. And I am super excited today to have, again, Dr. Shamili M. Nuyenhus with us. Dr. Shamili is an associate professor of pediatrics and an immunologist at the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. She's an expert in treating people with moderate to severe asthma, allergies, urticaria, and immune deficiency. Her research focuses on lifestyle interventions that address health equity in minority populations with asthma and sinonasal conditions. The interventions range from addressing diet, physical activity, and air quality. She is well-funded by the National Institutes of Health and has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles. Further, she is actively involved in community organizations that promote healthy homes and provide asthma education, such as the Chicago Asthma Consortium and American Lung Association. Dr. Shamili, welcome again to the show and great to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me back. Last time we focused on the linkage between climate change and respiratory diseases. We looked at the social equity aspect. Today we want to focus in more on the asthma and allergy triggers. What are actually the pollutants? that we need to look at here with regards to exposure, then we can treat and possibly avoid. Looking back at last time's discussion, what are the big issues, the big pollutants, Dr. Shamili, that we need to focus on? Yeah, so some of the major ones are ozone levels, as well as matter. And as was discussed on previous podcasts, there are different sizes of particulate matter. But the one that we often are most concerned are PM10, PM2.5, as well as ultrafine particles, which are less than one micrometer. So particularly with respiratory diseases, we're focused on either the PM2.5 or ultrafine because those are the ones that can get deep down into the lungs. The PM10s can definitely affect the nasal passages as well as the upper airway. But again, those very small ultrafine particles or PM 2.5s, those can really get down into the lower airway and cause damage to the cells as well as result in inflammation. And whether that's allergic type inflammation or a non-allergic type inflammation, that inflammation can then lead to symptoms such as cough or wheezing or shortness of breath or chest pain or chest tightness. Wow, that sounds scary. So If I understood it correctly, the PM10 gets basically filtered out by our body and doesn't go completely into our body. It gets stuck in our, let's say, own cleanup system somewhere. But the PM2.5 and even smaller than that, they go all in and really cause the damage. Correct. Correct. Those are the ones that we are more concerned about. And one interesting thing, which I wanted to bring up is that some of these particles, they can vary between, you know, dander as, you know, and allergens to, to other particles as well that are produced from cooking or cleaning. Those are where sometimes we commonly see those PM 2.5s. The other pollutant that we're concerned about a lot too, is the VOCs or volatile organic compounds because those two are frequently found inside the home or workplace and the indoor environment, but can definitely also be found in the outdoor environment. 
And the one thing that we really have concerns about VOCs in the development of asthma or also worsening of asthma is that sometimes like with diesel fuel particles or diesel exhaust, the allergens in the environment. So let's say grass pollen or tree pollen. I'm looking outside and there's some nice tree pollen coming out. Those sometimes bind together with the diesel exhaust or other pollutants in the air and make the protein that then enters your body even more allergenic or inflammatory. So those are some things to to be concerned about is that these pollutants as well as some of these other materials that might be in the air, such as, like I said, pollens, molds, when they bind together, those can be even more allergenic or inflammatory. So increasing the risk of developing asthma or allergies and also increasing the impact that they have on those diseases. Wow, that's interesting. I wasn't really aware of that so far. So I learned something new. And I guess that's a parallel to the discussion we had, where, you know, the idea is that maybe those infectious particles can travel on the back of PM 2.5 and piggyback, so to say. That's very important to know. So if we reduce PM 2.5 and PM 10 in our home environment, then the impact of those other, like the VOCs and the diesel fumes or whatever, is less risky for us. Is that right? Yes, yes. So it would be less riskier if we are reducing those allergens, but Definitely wanting to reduce those pollutants as well. You know, trying to reduce both would be ideal, but definitely we know that when there's high levels of those diesel exhaust particles or other VOCs, again, they can make those allergenic proteins even more allergenic. So that's something to be concerned about. And again, I know we talked in previous episodes about, you know, having small children in the home. So definitely making sure that you're not wanting to expose them to, again, like a super allergenic protein because you're having both of those exposures, you know, in the home. So generally, how do I figure out what is best to keep the windows shut or to keep the windows open? I mean, that's a question that maybe some of our listeners with young kids will ask themselves. Should they close their indoor environment or should they open it up? Yeah. Well, I would say definitely having some sort of what we would say objective monitor would be helpful because related to just the a subjective or more like talking to somebody, you don't necessarily get a clear picture on what could be triggering their symptoms. So again, having some sort of objective monitoring previously in the past, when we say objective, people would come into the homes and get dust samples and then take that to the lab. and then try to determine, okay, what is in those dust samples to find out, you know, what could be the potential pollutants and allergens in the home. But now we do have, you know, some very good commercially available monitors where people can kind of just plug in and just monitor, you know, what is going on in the home environment. So I think that is something that that can be very helpful for us to better understand what's going on in the home environment. Also to, you know, at least here in the United States, there's been a big push for also involving community health workers are usually people that can go into the home and actually do an environmental checklist to see, okay, you know, what is going on in the home if particularly too, you know, if you don't have availability to a monitor. But again, that's something, you know, might happen once a month. If you want to know what's going on from the morning to the evening to, you know, burn some toast in the house to, mm. you know, when you're you're cleaning the home or really see those fluctuations, having some sort of objective like air quality monitor that can really help determine. Now, the one thing is with the air quality monitors it does tell you the PM 2.5 or VOCs, but it might not tell you exactly like, oh, it's the pet dander that's contributing to mm. the PM 2.5, or it's the bleach I used to clean this that increased the VOCs, or was it, you know, the air freshener that I used? So it is something, you know, you can see, okay, the VOCs are elevated or the PM 2.5 is high, but it's kind of up to you also to kind of think in the home or to know, you know, what are the things that could be contributing to those elevated PM 2.5 or VOC levels. Yeah. What I actually noticed is when you do regular ongoing indoor air quality monitoring, uh, like I've done, you 
start understanding what the source of pollution might be. For example, comparing pandemic and pre-pandemic, it was easy to see how much is the impact of traffic in the neighborhood for VOC and PM2.5. Because I could compare when the lockdown happened in the Philippines and there were virtually no traffic movement at all, I could see the difference between before and after. And then, like I shared that story in, in a previous podcast, I was traveling and I could see there was high PM 2.5, but it was only for a very short period of time. And when I checked with my wife, oh, don't worry, it, it was the brother-in-law cooking something and burning something in the kitchen. So those small spikes, you then understand where they are coming from and you verify that with your family members, even though you're in a remote location, it's actually very powerful as a way of determining what is within your control and what is outside of your control. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. Something that with time, with the monitoring that you can kind of learn a little bit more about, okay, you know, what are the known triggers? Again, you mm. know, I think one of my colleagues, she has an air quality monitor and she knows around 9 a.m. her husband burns the toast. And so the, <laughs> the levels will go up. Um, and so, you know, as you said, but then there will be some other times where we don't know exactly and it's worth investigating. Okay. Or every time I'm using this cleaning product, that these levels are going up. So I think those are some of the things that doing monitoring can definitely help you better understand what are those exposures in the home. Yeah. and. We as well had very clear evidence that early in the morning and late at night, the air pollution levels went up because of the open burning in the neighborhood. I could have used that and maybe published it, but then I would have gotten in trouble with too many people. That's the situation in the Philippines. <laughs> and information is power, and it can help you then to decide what to do. Now, Dr. Shamali, what are your recommendations for young families out there for pregnant mothers with their, so to say, pregnant husbands. I mean, the husband isn't pregnant, but knowing from my own experience, we should take part in this experience. We should take responsibility for this experience. What are your tips how to minimize any risk for the growing baby or the young children to develop any form of respiratory diseases? What's the best we can do? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we still don't a hundred percent know, like, you know, this intervention will eliminate the risk for, you know, respiratory diseases, because sometimes, especially with allergies and asthma, the risk factors are multifactorial, and some of them are hereditary or genetic. But I definitely think, you know, good air quality. So in general, you know, keeping your exposure to VOCs less than what we, you know, one of the thresholds is 333 parts per billion, or your PM 2.5 levels less than 15 micrograms per cubic meter, you know, keeping your exposures down will help give the baby, whether it in utero or, you know, once it's born, probably, you know, some of the best chances to have proper lung growth and also reduce those exposures to those inflammatory responses that help happen either in the mother or once the child is born. So I think those are probably some of the best things to try to do. And again, as we talked about, probably some sort of monitoring, you know, would be helpful maybe with a combination of the publicly available data, which provides more outdoor results with the caution that there are some limitations mm -hmm. with that, that we discussed in a previous podcast, as well as using some sort of home monitoring as well, because that can potentially give you a better idea of what's going on in your home and maybe making some modifications prior to the baby being born. So I think those are some of the things to definitely consider, but more research is being done and hopefully we'll continue to learning more about how, what ways we can do to prevent these diseases. Great. Thanks, Dr. Shamali, for enlightening us. For me, the main conclusion for today is, you know, take the power into your own hands, educate yourself, understand the data, get the data, monitor, and then take the precautions because that is what we can do. And uh, thanks so much for those very practical tips. It was great to have you here today with us in the show. Join us again next month when we talk about smart integrations for a healthy home. Do we really need to do it? What are the benefits? And what factors should we consider when planning for a smart and healthy home? Thank you so much, Dr. Shamali, for a very enlightening session. It was great to have you on the show. 
Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. And I hope we'll have many listeners and more future questions for future podcast discussions. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Thank you.